Yeah. What's your name? I'm Kevin. Okay, well, nice to meet you, Kevin. Well, thank you everyone for joining us at the Spirit Room this evening. My name is Holly. I'm the gallery director here, and you've got Don, the executive director, right behind you. And we're here to celebrate Brian Prince Magical Landscape. So, Brian, if you would. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you well, first, I want to thank the Spirit Room for inviting me to the show here. I think it was your predecessor that saw my work in Fergus Falls a year or so ago, and then I got an email saying, watch the show here, and I was like, oh, that'd be awesome. Um, my son and his wife <laughs> live here, so any you know, I thought it'd be just kind of a nice opportunity to visit them and have my work here and everything like that, so I appreciate the invitation. Thank you to both of you. And I also thank you for the installation and helping me when I delivered it, uh, unwrapping everything and all that oh, yeah. stuff. I really appreciate it, Holly. Well, I just want to say something, and that is there are a lot of people who have seen the exhibit. That's great. That's yeah, great. Yeah, we had a steady stream of people, and I just didn't know how they knew you or how to, they arrived here. Yeah. And then we have all these classes, too, and so there have oh, been a lot wonderful. of people that have been looking at the work. That's wonderful. Well, I always love showing my work because it's a way that I can learn about I mean, it sounds dumb, but I think one of the things that people don't understand about when an artist makes their work, there, there's just a lot of, there's both a, uh, there's a measure of rationality and a measure of intuition, and you just kind of mix those things, and so a lot of what you do is uh, very unpredictable, um, and there's a lot of risk around that, and I think having an exhibition of the work that's the byproduct of that relationship teaches the individual a lot about, what, about how to move forward in the work. So, I appreciate the opportunity to hang them up on the wall and just kind of look at them and think about them. So thank you for that. Um, this body of work is, um, it's, been, it's, it's, it's a series of works that I call my magical landscapes. Um, and I call them that because um, to me, they're, while they're based on landscape painting, they're um, meaning I'm looking at trees and I'm experiencing the environment and I'm trying to reinterpret the environment through my paintings, they are a reinterpretation. So they're not like me trying to paint things exactly how they look. So they're not rooted in realism, they're rooted in more of a kind of a, both an experiential relationship to the landscape, meaning I'm walking through and I'm feeling the rain, I'm feeling the wind, I'm looking at the sun, I'm feeling these things. And those sort of uh, physical uh, sensations are part of the work in a way. And I'm also trying to translate um, natural phenomenon into visual sort of, a kind of a visual code or a visual language. So, you know, dots become rain or snow. Um, uh, certain kinds of marks become tree branches or, or tree limbs. Uh, other kinds of marks become cracked ice. Other uh, sort of linear patterns become pathways of a mountain. So I'm creating kind of metaphorical uh, relationships to the landscape through the types of marks I'm using and the abstract language I'm developing with those marks. Um, does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. that's, so that's kind of the, the basic idea here. Some are very um, directly observational, so like the two pieces over there that are framed. I'm, um, actually, I, never mind, I made those up, but they're basically, <laughs> I wasn't looking at trees, but I was like thinking about trees at kind of a, a more specific um, uh, kind of uh, image related, so they look like trees, but then again, they're, they're still invented in my mind. Whereas something like this, I, or these two paintings, I was thinking of mountains, but they kind of don't, you know, they're not exactly like mountains. They're more suggestive of what mountains are. And sometimes with these pieces, I just do something like this, and it's just kind of a formal solution to, you know, I had the whole painting done, and I was looking at it, and I thought, well, this is really boring, so I just started making dots, and there's lots of dots. And so sometimes something like that might relate to smoke or, or, um, or pollen or, or just, you know, ideas related on those sorts. Um, the the whole this whole thing I think came about because of my early influences of mid-century um, American modernism, with artists like Arthur Dove, uh, Marsden Hartley, George O'Keeffe, um, and Charles Birchfield. They were artists that dealt with the American landscape, um, but they were translating European um, modernist trends into this American idiom, which is the landscape. So they're looking at artists like Picasso. Um, or, or, or Monet, and they're thinking, you know, how can I, you know, they're being influenced by, say, futurism and cubism and surrealism, but they're trying to incorporate those trends into an American language, you know, it's rooted in the landscape. So that's kind of part of my thinking with these, too, is being influenced by those artists. Um, so you have somebody like Charles Birchfield, 
who did watercolor paintings of the land. And instead of um, um, sort of naturalistic re representations of the land, he was looking for a kind of a more spiritual connection. He was trying to do paintings of the, the kind of a spirit that he felt emanated from the landscape. And so, and so it's a much, I think, kind of a deeper um, representation, one rooted more in psychology uh, and um, sort of inner sensibilities rather than just sort of the appearances of things, if that's kind of makes sense. So those artists heavily influenced me when I was a kid, actually, because I saw those paintings at the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, what else? Even, I think even there are certain uh, processes I use. For example, in a lot of them, there's like kind of this poured and dripped thing. So I do, I've been doing this a lot lately. And to me, like where I just run paint across the top and let it run down. And this is my way of sort of asserting gravity. You know, it's like this gravity is a force that um, we all obviously have to deal with all the time. And we don't even think much about it. Um, and so, you know, I just let, let the paint kind of run to, again, assert this notion of, of it, it becomes kind of a, the, 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 the material is responding to the physical or the, the even the kind of, um, natural elements to kind of directly on that surface, if that makes sense. Just the, the, the paint running, so it's a way to kind of assert that. Um, other images I use, like this, this painting I call Sunset and Cracking, so I'm thinking about the sunset, I'm thinking about the sunset on a, on a plane of ice and the ice cracking, so there's this metaphor of cracking and peril and change and stuff like that in a painting like that that I'm kind of thinking about. Um, so I guess, some of the images are directly connected to nature, like ice cracking, and other images are just purely formal. Again, like just sort of dots to make something interesting in these. So, um, are there questions? Is your background as an art, uh, art educator? Mm -hmm. oh. Well, I don't know. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> I've been teaching a long time. Oh, good. Yeah. Why is that? No, I was just wondering, because of the way you talk about art. Oh. Well, um, I felt that was kind of incoherent, so. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I'm glad it, sounded, it had a certain coherence to it that suggested that to you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And did you teach at Mankato? Then? I still do. Yeah, oh, I teach do? painting and drawing there. Yep. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, is that the master's level or is that the. I teach the raw beginners to the graduate students. Yeah, wow. whole range. Yeah, that's yeah. fantastic. It's one of the pleasures of the job, actually. So I did, yeah, I really enjoy teaching, just introducing people to the idea of art. So yeah, yeah, oh, that's yeah. pretty fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I enjoy it. So you were saying that at the beginning of all of this, that mm -hmm. you feel like the process is pretty intuitive, and you just kind of go into it. You don't really have a plan at all. No, I, I never have plans. No, I never have plans. I just start painting. Um, um, Do you pick like a palette at all, or like a, even just what material? Like, do you have in your mind when you're going out to start your work? Oh, I'm going to work on this kind of material. Today, yes, or? I think that's one of the most important things for me um, is the surface, like what I'm painting on, the type of paint I'm using, um, and the tools I'm using with those materials and surface. So. Um, so like a canvas painting is totally different than say a pastel drawing. And so those, the material, I don't try to make a pastel drawing into a painting or a painting into a pastel drawing. So the material does inform the, the, sort of the look of the thing. And I'm not really, the other thing I think that's really weird about me is I really, uh, my teachers used to tell me to settle down. You know, like I'd be like working in about 100 different directions. And I remember my teacher saying, you gotta just focus on one thing, right? And I never agreed with that. Even when I was like 18, you know, they'd say, you just need to do one thing in concert. And I'd be like, why? It didn't make any sense. And it took me about probably, uh, when I started my series of pet portraits, which are on my website if you're interested, but I did this a couple years, a few years ago, I did a whole series of big pet portraits. And that sort of freed me from this idea of thinking I had to just do one thing. And I think it's sort of a condition of, of post postmodernism that really focusing on one sort of style or one approach is more about market than what is actually um, available to the artist. And I think a painter especially now has a whole range of options available to them. They don't have to focus on doing just this. You can do this, you can do that, you can just do a whole range of different things and it makes the most sense to do that. 
at this period. I definitely I think, agree with that. What's that? I definitely agree. Yeah, I think it resonates with a lot of people, but it's sort of contrary to what is thought of because the, because the whole idea of focusing on one sort of body of work or one way of working it is rooted in the idea of mastery. And so, but I think that's like just crap. You know, the whole idea of mastery is crap too. I mean, right? <laughs> Getting good at something or focusing or understanding the language is important, but the language now of painting, because that's what I'm into, um, is much more expansive and broad than one little niche. So I'm more interested in expanding that language. So, so there's a diversity of style, there's diversity of size. I don't really think about making things one size, you know, boom, boom, boom. I'm just like making things the way I want to make them. Which is fantastic. Well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I don't know. Um, and I respond to things, you know. Most of these are nature-based because I live in nature and I go out in nature a lot. Um, so like that painting right back there with the, the moon, I was, that's kind of the most recent one. Uh, I was camping, and it's related, it's, um, I was camping up with Wilbur in the Boundary Waters, and it was like two in the morning, I woke up and I went out of our trailer to go to the bathroom because it was two in the morning and I had to do that. And I was just standing there and the moon was like full blasting through the trees and so it was like this vivid sort of almost vision. That, and I went back to bed and fell asleep and woke up with this sort of image in my head and so I painted it. Um, so it's, hey, come on in, hi, how are you doing? Kent! Right. Hey, how are you, man? How are you? Wow, it's been a million years. Like, like, everything. like 30 years. Why do you look awesome? I knew you right away. So, you know, it's those kind of experiences that become subjects of paintings, or it might be just something in my studio, too. So, anyway. so it comes from actual experiences. It comes from the experience of making the painting, because making a painting is also an experience, like actually putting the painting down. So it's that informs the work. So it's a whole range of things. I just let all that happen. So. You have several pieces on, I believe it's aluminum? Yeah, it's just something new I've been messing around with, because um, for, for no specific reason other than it's um, um, a little bit, it's like, uh, well, I've been doing these pieces on Yupo, which is the, it's like a plastic paper that's really smooth. And um, I've been trying to replicate that look on a larger scale. So that's why I started trying the aluminum. And I um, didn't get it. Like those are aluminum panels that I gessoed, so they're more like um, like working on masonite or something. But that piece down there with the green ball sort of floating is on this stuff called dye bond, which is an aluminum panel that's already painted white, so I don't have to gesso it. So I'm just and I'm using acrylic paint on that too. So I pour the acrylic on, I'm getting that kind of look, starting to get that look that I get with the Yupo on the dye bond. So I'm going to try to scale those up. But that's a grant. <laughs> Wait for money to buy that I mean, those got to be expensive. Uh, they're actually cheaper than canvas. It's pretty good. They're pretty cheap. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, anyway. What, what I'm wondering about, so, I mean, you, you mentioned that in passing that, uh, it, let's say, we look at the Yupo and the turn of the last century, you know, that as an artist, you try to develop a recognizable style and that helps you with selling. So, mm -hmm. you know, that, like, this is the laundry on you. Know, right, that. right, right. So, um, where, and so I was always thinking, okay, if you're a faculty member, then you have the luxury of not committing to, like, right. in this commercial way. But um, another question I have is as a faculty member, you see so many different artistic visions and ideas from your students. Mm -hmm. And so I always think that must impact your practice as well, that you're as a way in a way always forced to think through other people's visual imagination and help them realize what they want to do and that that broadens your I think that does. Yeah, I think that does it probably but again I think the teaching you know, teaching and we could call it creative research for a second, just like what a person does in their studio and then what you do as a teacher are so intertwined that this idea of, um, like, I, I uh, my, my colleague, uh, Bob Finkler, maybe you remember Bob Finkler, Finkler Kent, we used to, he's, he's still around, still alive, long retired, <laughs> but, but um, he, he and I used to always joke because I was the new young faculty person, he was the, 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 my mentor at MSU, and he would just be like, I just don't understand what's going on now with art, with people, you know, with the students and stuff, so I think there's this really interesting sort of, um, I guess, symbiotic relationship between those that you teach and, and it's what you teach and what you learn from them. So, um, I, yes, 
to answer the question, yes, but I think it's it's more in tune with the larger sphere of what's going on with art, too, if that makes sense. So it's not just about the teaching, it's just about the... Because what we're talking about, uh, the word I learned when I was a student was pluralism. This idea, idea that, that the art world is very pluralistic, meaning everything is, is everything's going on all at once. There's no, like, single hierarchical sort of, this is fine art, this is sort of less fine art, this is less fine art, and this is like, you know, cow paintings and stuff. Well, suddenly, cow paintings are at the top of the hierarchy, or they're, or other, you know, so it's kind of, we live in a time where just everything kind of goes, you know, everything's serious, everything's not serious. Um, and then the interesting thing is students have access to it all. The, the best thing about the internet, I think, is that the students have access to all kinds of shit. <laughs> so if you set them out to look, you go and say, look up art that you like, and they'll come back with all kinds of garbage. It's just like garbage. And I find that fascinating. <laughs> when I was a student, I couldn't find garbage. I couldn't find it because I'd be looking at Art Forum, Art in America, all these magazines and journals. I'd look at slides. Everything was uh, mediated by people that knew what they were looking at. Well, that's no longer the case, and I find it quite interesting. It could be terrifying, if, well, on one hand. <laughs> it depends on where you're at it. But I find it really interesting, and it adds to this kind of um, expansion of the dialogue, which I find really fascinating. Uh, some people might think, it, me, think that it makes culture more superficial and shallow. Um, I, I just don't think it does. I just think it, it makes the tent bigger. So, I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, no, I, I kind think of that's really on. interesting. Like, I saw a couple of years that the, the Metropolitan Institute of Art made like 274,000 digital images yes. available yeah. for their Creative Commons. You know, so that is more pictures than, than anybody 50 years ago would have ever had a chance to see. Right, that. right. You no know, matter how many books you take out of the library or how many museums you visit, you know, that it, it, this explosion, I read from mean, I'm only 50, but still, I remember when I was a kid, like images were something precious, you know, mm -hmm. like you would get a picture of a horse from the they picture were kind of or something, you know, then you would sort of hang on to that and show them yeah. to your friends. Now if I want to see a picture of a horse, I Google horse and I get like one point seven million. And and all of them are brilliant quality and color and I could print them all off if I wanted or make my own collection, you know. So um, but in a way I don't have to because I can Reperform that search any minute of the day and right. get you know a similar range or even larger copy of results. So that must impact today's students as well. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And you know, God, I wish they would go to the Metropolitan Museum <laughs> site. <laughs> when I tell them to look at art, they just go, they Google art, and it comes up. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I have this exercise now to try to when I teach watercolor, I have you know what is good and what is shit. And excuse the language, sorry, out there in Facebook world. And so I'll, I'll have them just say a Birchfield watercolor paint, I mentioned, and then along with, a, you know, watercolors by Sherry. And it'll be the same content, the same everything. And they will always pick the watercolor by Sherry or whoever it is, you know, the crap one versus the Birchfield. And I just think a lot of it has to do with, you know, bad art tends to be really kind of superficial, kind of, you know, um, decorative. And uh, the Birchfield just always kind of loses to that for the, for the sort of, I that isn't trained, you know. So you do have to train people to look at these things and to discern. In, in that sense, I think it's probably a good thing to just get at it, you know, to like let them look up all the junk online and just kind of work with them as best you can. And, and then there's also, on the other hand, I'll just kind of think, well, there's a certain beauty in the um, richness of what you're talking about. The 10 million pictures of horses, there's something amazing about that fact, you know, that I love too. Uh, as a creative person, so it's definitely impacting. And I think this idea that I, you know, my own attitudes about the diversity of my work and my lack of interest in focusing on kind of one thing um, is um, sort of indicative of that state of mind, perhaps. And you know, we just don't have to anymore. We have access to so many tools and so many images and so many, we just don't. As artists, as creative people, we don't have to. Um, have to kind of focus on one thing, so I, I just it fits in with the way I am, I guess. So I don't know. But then on the other hand, I can argue that there's a certain kind of stylistic convention I deal with, and you know, body of work, and that there is a, there are a lot of um, 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 connections between my say my pet portraits and this body of work. There there are connections there. So because I'm making.
Well, that's wonderful. Yeah, is that long enough? Oh, that's perfect. Okay. Does anyone have any other questions? Yeah, have any other questions or anything? No? Well, thank you so much for talking. Thank and I My pleasure. Can we uh, yeah.